Turn with me again to uh, Genesis 2 as we continue our study of, uh, of the book of Genesis. We've just finished Genesis chapter 1, and uh, the last thing that we heard is that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And so this morning, our reading is just the first three verses of chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Thus ends our reading. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy, infallible word, it's not a a large text this morning, but um, critically important. We pray for understanding. We pray that your spirit is here, that you would guide my heart and my mind and my thoughts, and you'd be with my mouth and bring forth a good word. And that you'd give to each one here exactly the portion it is that they need to strengthen, to encourage, to lift up in your name. And for those that have not yet known you, Father, as, as Lord, as Savior, as Redeemer, as maker, Father, we pray that you turn their hearts so that they might confess Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. All these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. So we're up to the seventh day, and I think that for a lot of people that this is probably the most boring part of the week of creation, right? Everybody knows what the seventh day is about, right? Because we've read the law all our lives. And, and we know that, um, you know, the, the Sabbath day, keep the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And for in six days, he created the heavens and the earth. But on the seventh day, he rested. And, and so we, we know what it's all about. And, and so sometimes people don't even really see the connection. How does it really all connect? How does it all connect together? Well, I actually happen to think that this text is at least as important as Genesis 1 verse 1. And if you remember, when we were at Genesis 1 verse 1, I said that's the most important text in the entire Word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth because it sets the foundation for the entire Word of God. If God doesn't create the heavens and the earth, then he has nothing to say to us. He has no authority. The whole word of God is based on the authority of God as creator. And so Genesis 1 verse 1 is pretty important. But the thing is, is that in the last 31 verses, we've answered three questions. Who, what, and when? Who, what, and when, right? The who is God, and the, and the when is in the beginning, and the what is he created the heavens and the earth. But there's one question that hasn't been answered, and I believe that question is just as important, if not more. And it's actually, it should be a critical question in every one of our hearts. I believe that every human being has this, this particular question at some time or another, otherwise you're not a human being. The most important question is why? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Who, what, when, we know that, but why? Why did he do that? Right? Why did he create the heavens and the earth? And I actually happen to think that the first three verses of chapter 2 are about that. They're telling us something about but why God created the heavens and the earth. Which is critically important, right? Why did God do this? Because we're part of it. As we look up, we say to ourselves, why? Why did God create me? So it's kind of nice to know what God is thinking on his side of why he created Right? Because if I know why he did it, then I know my place. So I think that's pretty important. And I think that there's actually more that meets the, the, this text. There's more to this text than, than meets the eye. This morning, what we see, we're just going to ask a question. And we're going to try to answer that question. In verse 3, it says that God blessed the Sabbath day and he sanctified it. To sanctify it, to make it holy, we believe the word holy means to set apart. It's set apart. It's not like the others. It's set apart. It's lifted up. It's exalted. 
The seventh day is, is lifted up. It's exalted. It's set apart from the other six days. So think about that for just a second. If you look back at the days of creation, and I tried to do this this week. I'm, I'm trying to think. Which day could I cut out? Right? Which day is insignificant? Can we do without light? I don't think so. Can we, can we do without the firmament separating the heavens from the earth, our atmosphere? I'm pretty sure we need that. Can we do without the dry land, right, when he separates the dry land from the waters on the third day? No, nope, I think we're going to need dry land. How about the plants, right? The plants that feed not just not just the animals, but the fish, I mean, the plants, all the plants of the earth and the, and the trees and the fruit-bearing trees and the herbs of the field, no, we're going to need those too. How about the sun, the moon, and the stars? Yeah, we need those. The one day, fifth day, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't studied enough to know, but my sense is that not just would the world be poorer without birds and without all the creatures of the sea, but I think in some way that if we studied, we'd find out that they're necessary to life on earth. That was the only possible exception. And then, of course, day six, all the land creatures, all the insects, all the animals, and, of course, man. So you can't do without day six. So my point being is, is that if you look at all the days, every one of them matters. Every one of them is significant. Every one of them is critically important. But yet, God takes the seventh day and makes that day holy, and he lifts that day up. And so what we're going to try to do, we're going to ask a few questions. We're just going to kind of work through the text asking some questions to try to figure out the answer. Why does God separate this day and lift this day up so first of all i want us to notice that as you begin looking at the text that there almost seems to be a contradiction thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished now look at the beginning of the next verse and on the seventh day god Ended And the word ended there is the exact same word as the, the word in verse 1 to say finished. And on the seventh day, God ended or finished his work, which he had done. Now, this seems pretty odd, right? Because what, 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 what verse 1 is doing is actually summarizing what's, what's happened before, right? God got done on day 6, and he saw all the things that he had made, everything that he had made, and He's, and it, and it, behold, it was very good. And even in the morning were the sixth day. So that ends the creation of all the heavens, the earth, and all the hosts of them. That's what verse 1 is telling us. Thus the heavens, the earth, and all the hosts of them were finished. It's all done. Everything's finished. But God's work isn't finished. Right? Because look at what it says. On the seventh day, God finished or ended his work. So what work is God doing on the seventh day that hasn't been completed yet? It's not the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them. They're done. There's some other work here. And it's confusing because when we look at the next, when we look at the next clause, he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And when you look at the, the Hebrew and try to figure out what that word means, because that's the, the root word where we get the, the word Sabbath, but it means to cease. To cease. And it really just literally means to, to cease from activity. But, but a, back, let's back up for just a moment. So God rests on the seventh day he finished his work on the seventh day which is odd and then he rests on the, and he rests on the seventh day so which is it did he finish his work or did he rest so the first question before we get into what the word actually means is why does god need rest does god need rest 
Is he like you and I that he gets physically tired? That he gets mentally tired? That he gets spiritually wrung out? No, he doesn't. God's not like you and me. He's an eternal, spiritual being. And, and in the book of Isaiah, just to remind us about who this God is, he tells us in Isaiah 40, verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? In Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4, He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. We have a God that doesn't sleep. He doesn't rest. He doesn't need rest. So now we have to say, okay, so what does it mean that he rested? He rested on the seventh day. Well, the word sabaton just means to cease. To cease. The Hebrew word means to cease. It doesn't mean to rest. It means to cease. And what I mean by that is that if we take our understanding of rest, what is rest? For us, rest has two components. It means to cease from what we're doing because it's making us tired. And it means to replenish, to be re-strengthened, to be re-nourished. Right? If we need sleep, that we get sleep, etc. It doesn't mean to just cease. It also means to get strength, our strength back and to, to be renourished. And, and, and the Hebrew actually has different words for that. To cease is, the, is really what it means. So like in Genesis 8, verse 22, which is the next time we see this word, while the earth remains, now listen to this, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Same word, exact same word. So we don't think of seed time and harvest, cold and and heat, winter and summer, and day and night. We think of those things that are continue, and they can stop their activity, but we don't think of them as resting, do we? And in fact, one of the texts that that Moses wrote, Exodus 23, verse 12, actually brings us together with these two ideas. Six days you shall do your work, and then in our version it says, on the seventh day you shall rest, and it's the word Sabbath time, which really means to cease. You shall cease that your ox and your donkey may rest. And that is not the same word. It's a completely different word. Manuka, it means actually what we think of as rest, that you can stop your activity, but also that they would be nourished and strengthened, that they would have some time off and be refreshed. So God ceases from his activities. He ceased his activities, which he had done, on the seventh day. So, so brothers and sisters, what is the work that God does on the seventh day that completes his work? He ceased his work. The ancient writers, and already back in, in the Bible times, they had thought about this a lot because they saw this, they, they saw this issue in the text. They saw this, that, that, that there's something that God does on the seventh day that is not with the heavens, the earth, and all the hosts of them. That's done. But there's something, there's something else that God does, and he does it on the seventh day. And it has to do with this sea seed. And, and they actually, many of them came up, with the, they came up with the idea that God created rest. That God created rest. And, and I think they're on to something there. Right? Rest as a purpose for work. That was their kind of idea. That, that God actually created rest. And I, and I think they're close, but I don't think that's quite there yet. Because there's, there's something that's going on on day seven that really is separate because God says this thing makes this day so special that I'm going to lift it up and exalt it over all the other days. And just to make it, to, to, to cut to the chase, because I could keep doing this text thing, but I don't want us to get too confused. I want to look at verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested. Those two words, in it, 
are the most important and most ignored words of this text because they explain everything. They explain everything. You see, there's a work that God's doing, but it's not a work that we actually comprehend as a work. Because in it, he rested. You know what that means? When you think of God, what do you think? There's an illustration that uh, one uh, Bible teacher used. He was dealing with somebody that just didn't really believe. He says, I don't see any proof for God. And he says, therefore, how can I believe that God exists if I can't find any proof for him? And he, the guy told him a story about two gentlemen, Mr. Shoe and Mr. Battleship. And Mr. Shoe and Mr. Battleship were hanging out one day. And Mr. Shoe said to Mr. Battleship, he says, Mr. Battleship, I got a problem. I think I might be an atheist. And Mr. Battleship's like, dude, you are always going on with one thing or another. So what is it today? What do you mean you might be an atheist? And Mr. Shoe says, I don't know if I believe in Parker Brothers. Now, anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about, we're talking about the game of Monopoly. Okay, it's a board game. And you get tokens, the players get tokens, and they have different tokens. They have an iron, they have a shoe, they have a battleship, and some other stuff, wheelbarrow. Right? And each player has that part and that piece, and they go around and around the board. But on each Monopoly board, it says, made by Parker Brothers. So Mr. Shu says to Mr. Battleships, he says, listen, you and I have been together for years. We've been going all around this board. We've been on every square inch. We've been in jail. We've been in free parking. We've been on every square inch of this board. But I've never seen Parker Brothers. So I don't know if I can believe in them. And Mr. Battleship says, you are almost useless to talk to. He said, Parker Brothers created the game. They designed it. They built it. They set up a factory. And they sent it all over the world. But they're not in the game. They're outside of the game. And this theologian was using this as an example of our God. When our God created the heavens and the earth, he didn't do it from the inside, he did it from the outside. The Jewish people, even to this day, the, the Orthodox Jews, one of the names they have for God is they call him the place. He's called the place. Right? It comes from Moses in, in Psalm 90 that, that um, from eternity you have been our dwelling place. God is other than us. In a way, brothers and sisters, God is alien to us. He's an alien. He's a being of such supreme wisdom, knowledge, power, and glory that if you and I were to stand next to him, we couldn't stand next to him. We would cease to exist. He is so far above us in so many ways, you and I cannot even understand it. Can you imagine somebody that knows where every atom in the entire universe is at any time? You and I cannot even imagine that. We can kind of like think about like Isaiah, right? Isaiah sees that the Lord is sitting above the circle of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world are like grasshoppers, right? We can see like a kindly old man that is over there and he's got his arms around the whole earth. He's got the, he's got the world in his hands. We can, we can kind of picture that. Maybe we have a bigger imagination. We can imagine God having his, his arms around the whole solar system. But how many of us imagine God being bigger than the galaxy? The Milky Way. How many of us imagine God being bigger than, than the entire universe, which is filled with billions of galaxies? And yet he is. He is outside of it. He is bigger than it. He created it. And he created it from the outside in. He's outside the creation. He's not a creature of time. You and I, right? When, when God created the universe, he created time, 
space, and matter. Everything that you and I know is time, space, and matter. Everything. You and I can only sit down and try to imagine what it's like to not live in time. But God is timeless. He was before the creation, and he says he'll be after the creation. There, he has no maker. He doesn't measure time by years or months or anything else. We don't even know if he measures time. He's timeless. He's outside of it. So I think it's pretty amazing when it says, because in it he ceased from all his work. Those two words are telling us that God came inside of his creation. He came here. He came down into space, into time. Because that's what the seventh day is about. In it, in the seventh day, he ceased his work. Not from outside the seventh day. In it, he ceased his work. Because that tells us something about God. It tells us something about the six days of creation. God isn't some mad scientist, some crazy engineer that's got a weekend off Right and, and he doesn't know what to do and he's bored and, and finally his wife says go out and work in your shop or whatever and he, he doesn't know what to do and he looks around and finds a bunch of pieces of snowmobile and he spends the next 20, 22 hours putting together a snowmobile and everybody goes wow you must really love snowmobiles and he goes no I really don't uh, well what are you going to do with your snowmobile are you going to drive it no I don't really care to drive my snowmobile I, I just built it why because I could God didn't just do the creation because he could the seventh day is telling us about why he created the creation. He created this creation, the heavens, the earth, and all these living creatures, but particularly man, so that he could come down and join us. That he could be with us. So that he could put man because he, he gave man work to do but he was going to come down and he was going to be with us in this beautiful place God made a habitation and he didn't just make a habitation for man and the rest of the living creatures he made a habitation for himself the seventh day is moving day the seventh day is when God says I'm coming in I'm coming into the creation. The seventh day is when he moved into the house. And that has huge implications. Right? We don't have a God that's distant and far off. We have a God that's near unto us. Even in the Old Testament, even after sin enters the world, the psalmist says that God is near unto every one of us. He is near unto everyone who calls his name. We have a God who is alien in his, in his being. He's so different than us. He creates this place and then comes into this place. And he's telling us that the whole creation was made for a purpose. The creation was made for his delight. Most of all, I believe that God made it to express his love and to have fellowship. That's what the seventh day is about. That's what makes it so special. The people that say that, that the Sabbath is a creation day ordinance, God created six days to work and one day to rest, and that's going to go on into eternity, they are wrong, and this text proves it. Through this entire reading of Genesis chapter 1, how does every day end? And the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. What does it say in verse 3 at the end? doesn't say in the evening and the morning were the seventh day. 
You get that? That's why Jesus is our rest. Jesus is the Sabbath because he comes into the world, into a world of sin, to complete the creation, to bring it to its fruition. Where God and man are joined together in perfect fellowship. And the seventh day is the beginning of that vision in the creation. It's the beginning of that vision that God comes together in the same house with his image bearers. There's some things that have to be done, and, and that's part of the story going ahead. But brothers and sisters, this verses two, 1 through 3 are about that vision that God has. That he created this thing, and then he comes inside of this thing to become one with this thing. To become one with you and I. That's what the seventh day is about. And that tells us about God's purpose, and it also tells us about our purpose. That you and I will never be complete until we've been joined together with our Maker and our Redeemer. And this happens to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says that they who have believed in Jesus Christ have entered into this rest. Because that's why we were created. That's why God did it, and so that we could come together. Amen.